Hi, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the launch of the U.S.-China Business Council's 2020 State Export Report. Thank you all for making time this morning to hear from U.S.-China Business Council President Craig Allen. Before we get into his points today, just a quick reminder, when we get to the Q&A part of our program, you can hit star nine six on your telephone to unmute your line. If you're calling in from a computer, you can use the unmute function that's there as well. Without further ado, please allow me to pass it over to U.S. China Business Council President Craig Allen. Well, good morning, everyone. And again, thank you very much for joining us uh, today uh, virtually. I'm only sorry that we're not able to enjoy the normal rituals of the cup of coffee, cup of tea, uh, uh, bagel with some cream cheese, and I can't wait uh, to get back uh, to a more normal trend here. But thank you very much for joining us uh, today. I do believe that you have all received our uh, state export report, and um, we, uh, I will be making a few comments on that report, probably about 10 minutes. Uh, and then I would welcome any questions, uh, uh, concerns, uh, challenges uh, that you might have uh, following my uh, brief remarks uh, this morning. Uh, again, we are grateful that you are here and that we have an opportunity to discuss U.S.-China trade uh, at this time. So. At a time of deep anxiety and uncertainty in the overall U.S.-China bilateral relationship, it's useful uh, to carefully consider any empirical data that we may have. In the past, trade between the U.S. and China provided the ballast within the overall bilateral relationship. Since China joined the WTO 20 years ago, U.S. exports rose more than 500%, and agricultural exports from the United States to China rose over 900% by 2017, uh, the last full year of data before U.S.-China uh, trade and tariff escalation began. Year after year, we saw steady growth, and every year, more American workers, farmers, and ranchers benefited from growing exports to China. Well, I'm afraid that that trend uh, seems to have uh, halted, at least temporarily, uh, for 2018 and uh, 2019. These were very bad years for American exporters to China, so let's have a look at the data. On the good side, uh, U.S. goods exports uh, to China uh, fell in 2019 for the second consecutive year. The main reasons for the 11.4% drop uh, in U.S. exports last year were tariffs and an uncertain business environment. From 2017, goods exports to China have contracted by a cumulative 18%. Agricultural exports to China decreased by half between 2017 and 2018 as a result of tariffs. And while they recovered slightly in 2019, they remain well below historic levels. These numbers quantify the significant economic damage to American companies, workers, farmers, ranchers, and especially small businesses as a result of U.S. and Chinese tariffs. Even with the recent decline in export value and volume, trade with China is still very important to the American economy. China remains our third largest export market after Canada and Mexico for U.S. goods exports, uh, and last year uh, they were valued at nearly 105 billion. So that is no small figure. China remains very important, but the trend lines over the last two years have been down. On the services side, I should note that service export figures lag behind goods export figures. So our report does not include figures for 2019 service exports to China. But in 2018, services exports to China 
from the U.S. grew at a snail's pace, 1.6%, compared with the explosive growth of 230% over the last decade. China, again, is America's third largest services export market behind the U.K. and Canada. I need to emphasize that the data do not reflect the probable effects of, on trade due to COVID-19, which, as everyone knows, flared up earlier this year. In February, uh, U.S. goods exports to China decreased almost 20% year on year, which is on top of significant decreases in 2019 due to tariffs. So the WTO uh, released stark new figures on global trade uh, uh, expectations associated with the pandemic last week, which I shall address later on. But the WTO projects a decline of global trade between 13 and 32 percent. So while talking about the future is difficult, uh, we can at least lay down the facts uh, so far as we know them. So let me talk about uh, the tariffs and the purchase uh, commitments associated with the phase one uh, agreement recently signed uh, between the US and China. In 2020 and 2021, uh, in the phase one agreement, China committed to purchasing some $200 billion worth of US goods and services over the 2017 amounts as part of the US China phase one trade agreement. And that implies approximately a 40% uh, uh, increase in exports in 2020, followed by yet another 40% uh, increase in US exports of both goods and services in 2021. And if realized, uh, this could and should reverse the downward trend uh, in exports. But I should uh, also add uh, that the phase one agreement does not eliminate many of the tariffs already in place and China's uh, tariff exclusion process offers relief uh, to American exporters only a year at a time, uh, creating uncertainty which will continue to hurt U.S. exporters and Chinese importers. Lifting tariffs uh, should be uh, considered an important tool uh, in the wake of the pandemic. And thus, USCBC has joined other business groups and trade associations in asking the president to suspend tariffs on imports of Chinese goods for the duration of the uh, epidemiological and economic crisis. While this uh, full removal has uh, yet to occur, Recent actions, such as the suspending of tariffs on certain medical equipment needed to fight COVID-19, are a step in the right direction. We will continue to request that tariffs be lifted on a much broader range of goods, especially given the economic crisis that we are currently in. Without tariff relief, many U.S. companies, especially small ones, that are responsible for the majority of private sector jobs in this country will be seriously damaged. Last week, I was on a call with a good number of small company owners uh, and farmers in Kentucky, uh, and they confirmed in a very vivid manner that the tariffs were posing a grave threat on their operations, and in some cases, indeed, on their very existence. Uh, and I believe that these sentiments are very strongly felt uh, throughout the nation, especially among small and medium-sized uh, manufacturers and farmers. So let me talk about uh, jobs uh, a little bit. And here I regret that our data is not as crisp uh, as I would like. Um, however, uh, uh, our report indicates a 10% drop in U.S. jobs supported by uh, trade with China between 2017 and 2018, a trend that likely continued in 2019 and will be exacerbated by the uh, COVID-19 pandemic in 2020. So a 10% jobs, uh, a 10% drop in jobs associated with exports to China in 2018 does not necessarily imply 
uh, a one-for-one -one increase in U.S. unemployment provided that workers were able to find alternative jobs. And this was almost certainly the case in 2018 and probably 2019. However, it will be much more difficult for uh, workers to find alternative employment in 2020. Unfortunately, uh, from a data perspective, jobs data lagged behind goods and services export data by one year. So the drop in 2019 is more likely significant than 2018, uh, which is when the first round of retaliatory tariffs be began. But we do not have uh, good data on this. The shutdown of China's economic activity in the first quarter with hundreds of millions of people quarantined at home has also significantly reduced demand uh, for Chinese imports and uh, Chinese uh, exports uh, and U.S. exports. Uh, China is slowly reopening for business, but that recovery may be slow and will probably be uneven, something we would be happy to talk about in the Q&A uh, period. Say so just a couple words about the states. Uh, we have a lot of data on the states, and this is uh, useful at the local level uh, throughout America. While some states, like South Carolina, have become success stories, others have seen sharp declines over the last two years. Missouri, uh, for example, sold between $1.5 and $2 billion worth of goods to China each year between 2010 and 2017, but that value fell uh, below $1 billion uh, in 2018, rebounding only slightly in 2019. In, um, the state of Washington sold more than $11 billion worth of goods to China every year since 2013, but exports to China fell to just uh, over $5 billion U.S. dollars from Washington uh, to China last year. So looking ahead, uh, uh, our last two annual state export reports have shown trade tensions with China uh, beginning to erode our various prosperous uh, uh, export uh, uh, advantage and export growth over the last 20 years. Um, and now that we are struggling with the economic impacts of COVID-19 pandemic, trade and economic activity are weathering a sharp uh, downturn. Uh, as I mentioned, Chinese imports uh, fell, uh, uh, according to Chinese data, by uh, 3% in uh, the first quarter of 2020. And the WTO projects that trade uh, uh, globally will decline between 13% and 32% uh, in 2020. Uh, on the low end, uh, the WTO, uh, of the WTO projection, uh, we see a trade decline uh, that is similar to what we saw in the 2008 global financial crisis. The International Monetary Fund last week warned in stark terms that it anticipates uh, the worst global economic fallout since the Great Depression. So it is a fool's errand to project uh, trade uh, in uh, 2020. Uh, but now more than ever, what is clear is that we need sensible trade policies to help to mitigate the damage that the U.S. economy uh, is facing as a result of the global pandemic and to help the economy recover as expeditiously and robustly as possible. So in conclusion, we applaud the administration and the Chinese government for reaching a phase one agreement uh, that went into effect on February 14th. This was definitely a step in the right direction. The agreement addressed some serious concerns in intellectual property rights, financial services, and agriculture, and it sets ambitious targets to increase U.S. exports of goods and services of 40% in 2020 and 40% uh, yet again in 2021. However, uh, we note uh, that the tariffs uh, mostly 25% remain on $350 billion uh, of U.S. imports from China and also on most U.S. exports going into China. 
this is not a natural situation and it penalizes everyone, especially small and medium sized enterprises at a time of global pandemic. Therefore, we urge both governments to step up the pace and make progress on phase two negotiations so as to bring tariffs down to MFN levels as quickly as possible. Even incremental progress would we be welcome. Fulsome implementation of phase one and simultaneously rapid progress on phase two would be an economic tonic uh, for both countries and a welcome and positive step for the entire world. So let me stop there with my uh, preliminary remarks and welcome any questions that you would care to pose on uh, any subject that is of interest to you. We're on the record and I welcome um, your comments. Thank you very much. As a reminder, this now begins our Q&A portion of the program. As a reminder, if you're calling from your phone, you can hit star nine six to unmute your line and ask a question. If you're calling from a computer, you can unmute yourself on your dashboard. Uh, please go ahead with any questions that you might have. All right, we have a question from a phone. Uh, please go ahead, I unmuted you. Uh, I'm a free, uh, this is Jim Henry. I'm a freelance reporter uh, for a couple of automotive trade publications and, uh, and also for uh, uh, comments, uh, observations. Hi, I'm not sure whether I'm uh, I'm unmuted. I think we have someone on the phone. Uh, we would uh, welcome your comment, please. Uh, hello, this is Chris Gillis, American Shipper. I have a question. Can you hear me? Hello? Greg, this is yes. Anna. Yes. You yes. might have your side muted because a couple of people have tried to ask questions and I can hear them, but I don't think you're hearing them. Apologies about that. Please go ahead and uh, ask your questions now. Hi. Uh, this is Chris Gillis, um, American Shipper. Can you hear me? Yes, thanks, Chris. Please go Hi. ahead. Yes, thank you. Um, I just have a quick question. I know the um, uh, a lot of your analysis deals with the tariff impact on uh, trade between the U.S. and China and, and, and the exports. And I'm pretty interested on the export side. How about have you uh, considered the ex U.S. export controls in your equation, their impact on U.S. exports to China? in addition to you know, tariffs and, and other uh, non-tariff uh, trade barriers? Well, thank you, Chris. It's a great question uh, because uh, the expanded use of export controls has certainly had an effect on U.S. exports. Um, it is very difficult to quantify, however, uh, what exactly is the impact uh, of uh, the expanded use of export controls. Mostly that would be on a company company level. Mostly it would be for certain products, um, but uh, companies are um, uh, naturally shy uh, about that uh, information. So it's very difficult uh, and we found it uh, impossible to confidently quantify what would what has been the impact. I would also note that a lot of American high-tech uh, companies who have been uh, impacted by the expanded export controls uh, produce uh, through global supply chains, uh, a lot of times using facilities uh, in Taiwan, uh, Japan, Korea, uh, Malaysia, Singapore, uh, mostly, uh, 
for their uh, assembly and then final exports uh, to China. That further muddies uh, the data, uh, making it really difficult or uh, impossible to look at this uh, from a, a statistical perspective. Uh, one really needs to look at it from a microeconomic perspective, company by company. And that's something that's very, uh, that's something that's outside of our ability here. But certainly uh, export controls have been a drag on overall U.S. export uh, performance. Uh, it remains to be seen whether that will uh, grow uh, or remain stable. Um, I think that uh, decisions are being considered uh, uh, on a on a company by company on a technology by technology basis that certainly will have an impact on overall U.S. exports, but we're not uh, able uh, to parse out the data that finely so as to really um, uh, be clear about uh, the impact. I, I would say finally that one of the impacts of export controls is longer term. And uh, that is uh, that if uh, uh, our competitors are able to fill in uh, behind American exporters uh, in China, uh, say in the semiconductor or semiconductor equipment manufacturing uh, space, then number one, they'll probably be able to charge a higher price and number two, uh, they will be able to expand uh, their R&D and their, um, uh, their operations uh, uh, in China and outside of China more robustly than American companies. So uh, on the export control side, I think it's very valid uh, to uh, think about the numbers uh, of exports that have been foregone as a result of export controls. I think it's also very valid uh, to think about uh, the long-term implications of the export controls, particularly on uh, R&D and uh, American innovation uh, relative uh, to competitors uh, in Japan, uh, Korea, Europe, and indeed, of course, in China itself. So thank you for your question, and uh, I'm sorry that we don't have great data on this subject. I'd welcome oh, other you. questions. Okay, we've resolved our technical difficulties. Please feel free to, to unmute yourself and ask a question. Um, this is Chris Gillis again. Is it okay if I ask another question, American Shipper? Yeah, please, Chris. Okay, um, I don't, I, I don't want to like us to talk up to yet the time here, but one other question I have is, um, and I guess this is maybe looking uh, further ahead, and as we're seeing right now on, especially in the uh, in the West Coast ports, so we're seeing a lot of uh, liner carriers, and I'm referring to the container carriers, um, starting to uh, blank sailings. Um, uh, so basically due to the, the, the COVID-19 supply chain disruptions. Do, do you foresee that uh, being um, an impact on the, um, the U.S. exporters as well? I mean, I've heard that U.S. exporters are still, you know, moving goods over there, uh, but at the, during this crisis, but at the same time, is there going to be, uh, do you foresee any ripples in that, uh, uh, as this uh, thing progresses uh, through the uh, year? Yeah, very definitely. Um, and I think that uh, we need to remember that uh, China, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, uh, Malaysia, again, Northeast Asia, uh, has very uh, integrated and complex supply chains. And uh, if uh, there are is slippage out of Japan or Korea into China that will have an impact. Uh, if uh, the uh, Japanese and Koreans are not able to uh, supply uh, vital components to Chinese factories, that will have an impact um, uh, probably three way. Uh, so there's a lot of uncertainties uh, currently 
Uh, I think uh, agricultural supply chains are a little bit better, but they're not, they're not uh, walled off either. And um, there have been some problems in uh, the American uh, meat uh, uh, market in a, 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 at least one facility. And uh, so this is an ongoing uh, a set of issues uh, with global supply chains with uh, very unpredictable um, and difficult to, difficult to predict uh, consequences. Uh, also, Chinese exports uh, to third countries are often necessary for U.S. imports. Uh, I heard of a case of, uh, uh, in the apparel industry of factories in Central America shutting down as a result of a lack of um, very simple Chinese uh, inputs. But that's another case that would have been very difficult to predict uh, in advance. Uh, but something uh, that uh, we have seen. So we need to, uh, companies really need to, to focus like a laser on their supply chains uh, and transportation networks uh, to ensure uh, non-disruption of, of, uh, of uh, business uh, in these months uh, ahead. And uh, the progress of COVID-19 is, it's in it, in and of itself uncertain. Uh, the Chinese uh, are very uh, rightly concerned about secondary infections and have taken strict controls. And I think that they are showing more and more confidence in those controls. But they, more than anyone, know that this is not absolute and not certain, and uh, that the effects, uh, the full effects on supply chains might not yet be known. So thank you for that. I would welcome other questions from uh, other uh, reporters, please. And, and just as a quick note, you hit star nine six if you're calling in to unmute yourself. Please feel free to ask. Forgive us for our technical problems here. We would welcome any questions. Let me say, going once. Going twice. Huh. Uh, we have a question here in the comments, but it looks like uh, the mic is not working. Um, sir, if you'd like to raise your question here, I'd be happy to ask it of Craig. Question from one of the reporters, Trevor Williams. What are you hearing about the Chinese capability to meet its purchase commitments under phase one? And is there any political will to move ahead while blame shifting on the pandemic? So um, one of the very positive uh, parts of the bilateral economic relationship is that both governments are fully committed to meeting their commitments uh, under the phase one agreement. Now, I think that both governments also realize that this uh, will not be easy. Um, however, we have seen a uh, very early but good growth, uh, particularly on the agricultural side. So, um, and that would be true for pork, uh, for so soybeans, and for beef, um, other proteins. And um, that is a uh, important uh, first step. Uh, also, the Chinese have met 
uh, most of, uh, if not all of their commitments under the phase one uh, agreement. So some have been delayed. Uh, for example, we had been looking forward to the publication of the IPR, Intellectual Property Rights Action Plan, and that has been delayed. Um, what we are told is uh, as a result of a delay, uh, the National People's Congress, which uh, has to change some laws, and that had been scheduled uh, for March. Uh, it was delayed, and therefore the IPR Action Plan is delayed. Um, but uh, in most of these areas, um, uh, particularly financial services, uh, agriculture, uh, and intellectual property rights, we see uh, the improvements that we had anticipated. Some slower than uh, we had expected uh, as a result of COVID-19. Um, but the directionally, uh, we are uh, going in the right direction. I think on the financial services side, uh, many of our members have received approvals for expansion or new products or new services uh, for uh, a larger degree of ownership. And all of those are very uh, positive steps forward. So I would have to say that uh, the, uh, it's not 100% uh, a uh, record of success. There have been some stumbles as a result of COVID-19, but the overall directionally, we are headed in the right direction, especially with regard to agricultural exports. Now, I would have to say that on uh, the other exports, um, if COVID-19 is uh, extended, uh, has a longer duration than any of us would prefer, then uh, meeting the commitments will become yet more difficult. Let's take services as an example. Um, many, the bulk of uh, the service exports that were anticipated uh, in 2020 and 2021 were associated with travel, tourism, and education. And if uh, clearly those are not going to happen uh, if COVID-19 uh, is extended and if uh, there is effectively uh, uh, restrictions or indeed even a ban on uh, travel between our two countries. Uh, and so there's gonna be uh, uh, problems there uh, if COVID-19 is extended into the summer or beyond. I think on the manufacturing side, um, this is going to be more complicated uh, simply because uh, demand in China is down um, and uh, uh, the degree to which American exporters are going to be able to meet that demand uh, with factories uh, currently not at full capacity is another question. Let's take energy for a second. I think all of us know that energy prices have declined, uh, I don't know what it is today, but around, by around one third. And thus the price of uh, natural gas uh, and oil uh, uh, crude uh, to China uh, from the United States has also been impacted. Coal, I'm, I'm, I'm less clear about. Um, so I think in manufacturing, in services, uh, in energy, we're going to have challenges. Agriculture is a little bit uh, better and, and more positive, uh, especially given the fact that the United States has significant reserves uh, in um, and indeed uh, inventory uh, in most of uh, the agricultural categories that we're able to uh, supply China with without any strain on our production or supply chains. So uh, the picture is mixed. Uh, directionally, we're, we're strong, uh, but I think to be um, complacent about this would be a big mistake. It'll be a huge challenge to meet those commitments. Thank you. We have another question from Don Yu, reporter with the China Review News Agency of Hong Kong. Many people say 
the Trump administration is trying to use this pandemic as an opportunity to push the process of economic decoupling from China. Do you have any insights on this? And is it feasible to realize this goal? Well, I think that the pandemic has definitely uh, accelerated or uh, exacerbated uh, existing tensions within the bilateral relationship. It is uh, very unfortunate uh, that the pandemic has uh, led to uh, yet less uh, mutual trust rather than really what we need uh, is uh, greater trust uh, between the two governments. And uh, I think that, um, that indeed uh, the pandemic uh, is uh, a, a point, uh, uh, an inflection point, uh, at which time the US-China relationship is either gonna get better or gonna get worse. And what I will argue is that this is a time that we have a mutual uh, concern, a mutual enemy, a mutual threat uh, that is killing both Chinese and Americans. And it makes uh, all sense to collaborate on uh, this common threat, uh, both in terms of uh, research and development, developing a vaccine, uh, testing a vaccine, uh, developing um, uh, cures and, and, and testing them, but also on uh, the uh, expanded trade uh, within uh, PPE uh, or other medical uh, related equipment uh, that is absolutely necessary to keep our healthcare uh, providers safe. And uh, here there has also been some tensions um, but uh, we see multiple, uh, I, I believe thus far, 25 plane loads of uh, product that have been delivered expeditiously from China uh, to the United States. And I understand that some 40 additional plane loads are uh, in preparation. And the, that product, particularly at this time, is very uh, much needed and uh, is something uh, uh, should be a, a bridge, considered a bridge, uh, to help uh, the countries to uh, plan uh, for the future. So let us hope uh, that this common crisis uh, will bring us together rather than tear us apart. But certainly that is not uh, preordained and the dangers are, I think, stronger uh, that this will lead to yet more distrust uh, and uh, make it more difficult to put the relationship on a stable footing that business and, and, and workers and I think society on both sides uh, really uh, wish for. So the USCBC uh, will be working uh, to uh, expand trade, to expand investment, uh, despite uh, the pandemic, uh, we think that the phase one agreement sets a firm foundation uh, for continued economic, economic stability and growth uh, between our two countries. And we will strive to build on that uh, for the benefit of both Americans and Chinese in the future. Thank you. Follow up question. How do most of your members think about the decoupling issue? Do they want to move their production out of China to the United States? I think uh, virtually every single one of our members would be uh, against decoupling in principle uh, and rather uh, appreciate uh, the benefits uh, of globalization, of long supply chains, of uh, being able to take part in China's economic growth. We have to remember that uh, almost certainly China will provide an outsized portion of economic growth uh, for the next decade, if nothing else uh, as a result of rural to urban migration uh, from uh, the Chinese countryside into the city, which uh, in and of itself is going to produce um, 15% uh, uh, about of global growth. China as a country will produce 
as much as a third of global growth over the next decade. And therefore, there are not many American companies that wish to uh, uh, divorce themselves uh, from that economic growth. Um, nor are there many American global companies that would agree that they can be successful global companies if they are not global, globally, if they are not successful in China. To be a successful global company means that you are successful in China. And therefore, there are uh, very, there are no members of the USCBC who are willing uh, to decouple uh, from China. Rather, we wish to grow our businesses in China. We wish to expand um, our collaboration with China. We wish to grow our exports uh, to China and in doing so, produce more American jobs. It is true, however, that in some areas that there has been an over-reliance on China, uh, particularly in some sensitive areas, such as some active pharmaceutical ingredients and others uh, areas. There are some uh, medicines and active pharmaceutical ingredients that are made almost exclusively in China. And that is an unhealthy situation. Rather, there should be a diversification of uh, production around the world, uh, such that if there is a shutdown or a slowdown in China, uh, heaven forbid if there is conflict with China, uh, that uh, we would be assured of supplies uh, coming from other sources. So uh, in a supply chain, from a supply chain perspective, having a single point of failure is never a good thing. And if that single point of failure happens to be in China, that's also not a good thing. Uh, in some industries, uh, there has been an over uh, specialization in China. China uh, 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 is responsible for an excessive amount of, of supply. We see that particularly acutely in the pharmaceutical se sector. So clearly there should be diversification of supply. That is perhaps an opportunity for Chinese uh, investors uh, in those same areas to invest outside of China, to uh, ensure that their operations are, are run smoothly on a global basis. It's also an opportunity for American uh, and other manufacturers to invest uh, domestically at home or elsewhere, wherever it makes economic sense. We don't wish to increase costs, but we do wish to uh, ensure that we have a properly diversified supply chain uh, so that we're able to mitigate the risks of a single point of failure, regardless of where that failure is anywhere in the world. So I thank you for your question, and I'm sorry to give uh, a rather long-winded uh, uh, answer. Thank you. We're now open again for questions. You can hit star nine six on your phone to unmute your line. Well, I would welcome any questions, um, uh, but if not, uh, we can adjourn the meeting. Uh, please uh, let yep. me know if there's something that you would like to discuss. Yeah, this is David Brunstrom from Reuters. Can you hear me? Yes, hi, David. Oh, great, thank you. Uh, I, you mentioned PPE uh, just uh, a little bit earlier. Um, um, I'm wondering, um, is the uh, are the Chinese export restrictions uh, on uh, medical goods still a problem? Um, I noticed that the Wall Street Journal had a story um, uh, just this morning uh, indicating that uh, that it still is. Although I think um, your organization was um, saying yesterday that uh, um, it, it seemed to be moving in the right direction. Can you do you have any detail on that? Yeah, thank you, David. Um, so 
it was on um, April 1 that the Chinese government imposed uh, some quality standards on exports of PPE. Why did they do that? Uh, they did it in response to very harsh criticism, particularly coming from the EU on some substandard um, exports of Chinese equipment that uh, failed uh, to do what they were uh, supposed to do. And so the Chinese uh, government reacted to that very harsh criticism uh, but with the imposition of some quality uh, uh, standards. And this created uh, some uh, confusion uh, within uh, the market. It was a well-intentioned policy uh, to ensure the quality of Chinese exports, but it unintentionally limited U.S. companies from shipping PPE out of China. So some of our companies approached us on this subject, and we had a very good set of uh, discussions uh, with a relatively high level of the Chinese government over the last uh, few days. And what resulted from that was that orders made before uh, April 1 uh, can uh, be, sh be shipped. Um, and orders made after April 1 um, uh, can be shipped and the Chinese government is uh, um, making allowances uh, and working with our companies to ensure that they're able to uh, ship out. So we have uh, companies uh, that are manufacturing in China. Uh, we have companies, uh, retailers, for example, who wish to purchase from China. And then we have companies that uh, wish to uh, purchase for themselves, if you will, on a, uh, on a uh, spot uh, market uh, for their own internal uses. And so I uh, think that uh, we're ironing out uh, the problems. I can confirm that there were problems uh, and an unintended consequence uh, to, and if you will, an overreaction uh, to um, uh, a, a positive step forward but, uh, uh, by the Chinese. I would also say, by, by way of background, that the medical device industry in China is vast and, and uh, typically under-regulated. And you have a lot of uh, many, many players uh, out there, some of whom are not uh, uh, particularly good. <laughs> and indeed, buyer beware. Uh, particularly in this time of, uh, of a, a spike uh, in demand. Um, and um, it is a good thing that the Chinese government is trying to regulate uh, its, uh, the quality uh, of exports coming out of China. Um, but also uh, the Chinese government needs to ensure that legitimate exporters and uh, products that meet quality standards are able to be exported uh, smoothly, uh, efficiently, effectively, and cheaply. And I think that we're, uh, after some adjustments, are getting um, into a more predictable place uh, here. And as I said earlier, uh, Chinese exports are, are, are flowing into the United States in huge numbers. And uh, of that, we should all be, uh, uh, we should all note that and uh, uh, be grateful uh, on behalf of our emergency doctors, nurses, uh, and, and workers who are dealing with a deadly uh, virus. Thank you. Could, could I just follow up? Uh, are you able to hear me still? Sure. <clears throat> but I just wonder from a consumer's perspective, um, the, the issue, for instance, of uh, face masks, and I think that uh, New York uh, is going to be expecting people to wear face masks um, uh, in certain environments, and I think the CDC uh, has recommended a couple of weeks ago, or a few, uh, at least more than a week ago, that uh, people should wear them. Um, 
but if you actually try and purchase uh, face masks, it's, it, it's very difficult. And so people are resorting to making them themselves. So can you shed any light on, on, on that particular issue? Uh, I'm not talking about specific, uh, uh, masks specifically for medical professionals, but for, you know, ordinary people. They seem to be difficult to get hold of. And is that being held up because of... Uh, uh, these issues with China, and is there anything to indicate that uh, that issue may be resolved? Thank you. Yeah, yeah, it's a great uh, question, um, and I don't really know the answer. Um, I think that the focus uh, now is on, uh, appropriately, on uh, protecting the medical professionals <laughs> with a highly technically sophisticated uh, product. Uh, both masks, gowns, goggles, and uh, vast quantities have flown in, uh, have been flown in uh, from China over the last two weeks. Um, so I'm, I'm sorry that I'm not able to respond uh, to the question. Um, I do know, uh, however, that uh, there's a lot of uh, poor product uh, being made around the world uh, and a lot of um, marketing uh, that uh, seems like it could be misleading. So again, I would repeat, buyer beware, uh, because uh, this is uh, a very uh, strange market. Um, uh, and the other thing I would add is that if, uh, for medical quality uh, face masks, uh, let's ensure that our uh, medical professionals have first um, uh, have first options on those. Uh, those who are on the front line need to be protected, uh, and I uh, would hope uh, that uh, that they are with the highest quality uh, equipment uh, available anywhere around the world. And I think that China is supporting the United States uh, in that very important task at the current time. Thank you. Additional question from the audience. Is there a quick way to summarize what are US tariffs on auto and auto parts from China and vice versa and have those numbers changed? US imports of uh, Chinese automotive parts. Um, I would ask for the opportunity to get back with you on that. Um, I'm sorry I don't have that uh, top of mind. Uh, um, I, I, uh, if we can have your name, I uh, am happy to, uh, to respond to that over the course of, within the next few hours. All right, we have time for just one final question and then we'll conclude today's session. Uh, that question, is have you heard anything on, from the U.S. side on whether tariff relief will be applied further? So U.S. Uh, TR is uh, has accepted uh, suggestions or uh, proposals for additional decreases on tariffs or on products that might be used uh, to fight COVID, and these are some things that are semi-medical, not necessarily uh, medical, things like uh, hand sanitizer and disinfectant and uh, other uh, hospital and uh, equipment. And so we are, uh, we believe that they are considering uh, further reductions uh, on tariffs uh, in those product categories. Now, we have suggested that all tariffs be removed for the duration of the epi epidemiological and the concurrent economic crisis, which are so inextricably interlinked. Um, but um, we have no evidence uh, that uh, either the White House or the USDR is considering that uh, proposal. Uh, we continue to believe that it makes uh, economic sense. And we know that uh, tens of thousands of American uh, farmers and uh, particularly small and medium sized uh, manufacturers also are looking for relief, uh, particularly at this time. So we do think uh, that uh, at least a, a, a temporary moratorium uh, would be a good idea. Um, we, uh, at the same time, uh, want to see continued progress in phase two 
uh, issues uh, which we have not discussed here today, be it intellectual property rights, uh, state-owned enterprises, cyber, anti-monopoly law, um, and subsidies. Uh, those issues remain, uh, and we're grateful for USTR's continued focus on them. But in the meantime, we have a crisis uh, that we need to get through, and we believe uh, that a moratorium on tariffs would be a wise uh, approach to provide relief uh, to American uh, companies, American consumers, American uh, farmers, uh, and uh, we hope that both governments will consider uh, that proposal and uh, implement it uh, just as soon as possible. So with that, uh, let me thank all of you. We wish to remain very open to the press. Uh, I am happy to talk with you anytime. Uh, please go through uh, Doug Barry or Ian Hutchinson, and uh, you have access to us, uh, uh, I won't say 24-7, uh, but um, uh, let's say 18-7. Happy to talk to you uh, at any time about U.S.-China trade, uh, technology, uh, investment, or other issues. So with that, uh, let's draw this to a conclusion, and again, uh, the next time we meet, I hope it is with a cup of coffee and a uh, muffin or uh, some uh, fruit uh, in our hands. Thank you very much, and have a great day. Bye.